What's going on, everyone? You are tuned in to Technically Divided, an original Hacker Valley media experience where we're going to explore the most divisive topics in technology. And today's divisive topic is a question that's been on my mind for years at this point. Is there a gap in cybersecurity, whether we're talking about skills or personnel? So let's cut right to it. Is there a gap in cybersecurity, whether it's skills or personnel? <sighs> Give me more scotch. <laughs> <laughs> I got you covered. <laughs> Technology was simple back in the day. We might have had a few computers, a few workstations, maybe a server if we were super fancy. But then we started to bring on IT solutions to help us run the network, do other things for connectivity. We also did things, uh, brought on solutions for security. Mm -hmm. But we didn't stop there. We expanded beyond those walls. We brought in things like mobile phones. Everyone's carrying a computer in their pocket. And those computers touch resources on our networks. So now we have information all over the world. Now everything in our building has an IP address. And what is that? That introduces attack surface, right? So it makes it much more difficult to protect. And so what we've been hearing for years is that there's a cybersecurity skills gap. 500,000 in the US that we're missing. Or by a certain, certain date, there's gonna be 3.5 million missing. It's like, yep, up, oh, duh, makes sense. We have all these job racks that are missing. But it wasn't until we brought Andy Ellis onto our podcast and had a conversation with him. And right then, in that moment, I said, there's more to this than meets the eye. What is your perspective? Do we have a gap? It's a very good question, and I'm going to take it apart from two directions. The first question is, are there enough people to actually fulfill the roles, and do they have the expertise that we require, right? And the second question is, why is it so many people are having trouble breaking into cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll simultaneously hear that we have this deficit, and I've heard the same figures, 500,000, right. 3.5 million. I've even heard of by such and such day, it'll be 7 million bodies <laughs> shy, you know, right. of what we need to defend the nation and, and the world and all this, all this good stuff. And it's valid to say that we don't have enough bodies in seats right now. That's a fair statement. But if you flip that around and ask these people that are trying to break into cyber why they're having so much trouble breaking into cyber, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. We're doing two things wrong. First thing we're doing is we're not putting good job descriptions out there. We're acting as if every skill in cyber is a vocational skill that you've already got tidied up, that you can put in a box, slap a sticker on, and know exactly what that skill is, and line it up next to the other 15 skills you need for that role, and say, here's the exact 16 labels that I need on this box. Go find this person. That approach is not going to work. It's never going to work. Right. The second challenge is that we're not promoting from within. It's a recurring theme that we post jobs that are listed as entry level and then immediately have a list of demands like five years experience. Yep. If it is entry level, by definition, <laughs> there is no experience. It is entry right. level. If it is entry level, you cannot insist on, for example, a CISSP certification, which mm -hmm. by definition requires you to have been in the industry five years before you could get yep. your certification. So there's a lot of contradictory nonsense going on in terms of how we're posting. So, so the way we solve these two problems, and, I, and I've got to give props to Andy as well, because I've, yeah. I've talked to him about this as well. He and I both agree that you promote from within and backfill the junior role. Mm -hmm. We're both in agreement on that strategy. That solves a lot of the problems right there. If you've got somebody that's close to being the senior role and the senior person leaves, you promote them up to that senior role, give them that opportunity and backfill the junior role. Mm -hmm. Now it's easier to find talent on the field and you're at the same time rewarding your own people. It's, it's, it's a double win because if people feel like there's no way up for me, well, that's why the senior guy left in the first place most likely, right? People say, number one reason anybody leaves is a bad boss, right? For me, number two reason is when you feel like you can't make a difference mm. or number three, when you feel like you can't grow and go. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe two and three are even interchanged. Yeah. So if you've got a senior person who feels like they're stuck, they've hit a ceiling, they're going to go to some other organization where they can grow and go, where they feel like they can make more of a difference. So that's the person you want to reward and promote up as much as you can, and you want to backfill on the junior side. So that solves two of the problems of the, the entry-level job description right. with five years required 
No, make it an actual entry-level position and mm -hmm. actually bring someone in. And then to Andy's clever point, there's a lot of skills out there, to, to my 16 labels on the box metaphor from earlier, there's a lot of skills out there that allow you to do what you need to do in cybersecurity without having all 16 stickers, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets very interesting. You, you look at my personal career and background and all this. I started as a liberal arts major in college, paying my way through school, working IT jobs. So I learned IT on the go in the real world while educating myself and giving myself a classical education. What I was learning had nothing to do with what I was teaching myself real time on the job. In other words, IT is a vocational skill of the sort that you can teach yourself. It's something that can be picked up. It's something that you can adapt to, learn, study, buy a book at the bookstore, yep. you know, get another book off of Amazon, whatever. You can self-educate on cybersecurity. You can. What you can't self-educate on so handily are some of the other skills that are required. Communication skills, professionalism, gravitas, presence, uh, ability to present to a room full of people, uh, deep analytical skills, critical thinking. These are the kinds of things that take years and years and years to develop in some cases versus somebody who's already got all those skills could pick up cyber more quickly than somebody who's already got cyber can pick up those skills. Mm -hmm. And so to me, this is another piece that, I, again, I agree with Andy on this one, is find people who have those skills, teach them the cyber, rather than trying to insist on the cyber skills being there at, at the moment they walk in the door. You've been on the podcast a bunch of times on this show. Right. But I don't really know what your origin story is. What, is, what has it been like for you in the cybersecurity realm? Oh, wow. So, all right, well... You know, my dad was a mainframer, and so I'm second-generation InfoSec. I, I literally grew up going with my old man to work to go play on the mainframes and do punch card stuff when mm. I was a little bitty kid right. doing that kind of stuff, helping my dad write programs and stuff when I was little. And so by the time middle school came around, uh, we had the very first IBM PC, the, the one floppy drive model. We eventually upgraded to two floppy drives. Ooh. No hard drive, but two floppies. <laughs> and um, I had a good friend who had an Apple IIe at that same time period. And he had a, uh, the, the old coupler style modem that you literally set the phone in the cradle. And um, that's when I began what I would consider to be my cybersecurity career, although maybe not necessarily on the same side of the fence that I'm on now. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, we were war dialers and BBSers and breaking into banks and everything we could possibly do to explore and play and just learn the world of computing. And I was doing all that all the way back in middle school. We're glad we got it on camera. Please. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we got them, boys. I usually <laughs> add back in the 80s before there were laws against such things. <laughs> My mom didn't actually know that I was going to be born with a birth defect. It used to bother me quite a bit. She is just like you guys. The message of control and complexity doesn't just apply to one subject in life. That is a universal truth. When a challenge feels too big, break it down to the parts that you can control. I want to flip the question on you, Chris. <laughs> Do we have a skills gap? I think it's funny. When we were going through this, talking to a lot of different people, talking to Andy, talking to Alyssa, really, I feel like we're saying a lot of the same stuff. We're just looking at the problem. We're looking at definitions slightly different. People say, is there a skills gap? So in some people's mind, that gap is, are there job recs out there that aren't filled? Yes, yes, there are. Yes, That's true. So, but when you hear people like Andy and yourself and even me to a certain extent say that there isn't necessarily a gap, people are like, well, you're wrong. That's not, that's not correct. There's all these jobs that aren't filled. But I do think that there is a bit of a mismanagement on our part, the leader's part, the employer's part, as to how we're looking for these people to fill these roles, how we promote people from within. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we got to work out. So I think there is a gap, but I think it's more of a disconnect mm -hmm. than a gap. Right. I, I think that's the same. It's almost like when you combine all these forces and you start to, to look at them and unravel it, you see the employer on one side and the job recs, you see the, all the, the job openings on one side, but also you have the person, you have the individual. Like as an individual looking for a job, especially breaking into cybersecurity, you might not know what skills you need. You see a job wreck and it says you have to have five years of experience right. as an entry level. 
Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I don't have five years of experience. What's the next thing? Tells you you have to be expert level and maybe a system or application. Mm -hmm. Start to get that expertise. You get the job. You might not need that skill at all. You might need other skills. There's all these factions of cybersecurity. And it's hard to like really pick where am I going to focus my time and my energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So positions to get started with that help you break in. Let's imagine that the job description doesn't say entry level with five years. Let's imagine it just says entry level. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the different roles on the team. Cybersecurity analyst. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs an analyst. Somebody that can, that can tear through ideas, come up with concepts, do research. Analysts are a valuable position. Yep. Pen tester, another classic position. Mm -hmm. Uh, tech stack engineer, somebody that can actually manage and run the whatever it might be, the CASB, the DLP, the, the firewall, the EDR solution, whatever. Somebody that's actually running tech stack. Uh, architects, which is obviously a more advanced version of the it same, is. you know, and uh, GRC. Let's not forget GRC. Yep. You got the folks that need to get into policy writing. You got the folks that need to get into tracking risk, governance, et cetera, et cetera. Every one of these roles in every organization has an entry level variant to it. And every one of those entry-level variants has a different set of skills required to get in the door. Mm -hmm. To start as a pen tester, you could come in from a QA background. Just a good QA engineer who knows how to do things like, like form field validation and, and stuffing, you know, oh, it's asking for an integer. I'm going to give it 9,999, and then I'm going to yep. give it negative one, and then I'm going to... Just basic QA testing skills apply pretty quickly to pen testing. You can pivot from one to the other pretty well. Mm -hmm. You could have somebody who's a research person. Uh, and I think Andy Ellis' example was a librarian. Yep. Somebody who's got really good research skills can become an analyst very quickly. Very quickly. Somebody who is a good policy author who's been a technical writer mm -hmm. from a, a, some other technical background could very quickly start writing governance policy with some guidance and some help from the team. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an entry-level skill set for each and every one of these roles that isn't unique to that role. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a skill set that comes from outside of that role somewhere else yep. altogether. Have you seen the show Yellowstone? Either one of you? No. I, not yet. Super, super, super cool show. As Kevin Costner, he runs this big, giant ranch in, in Montana, and it's really about the lifestyle of a cowboy. And one of the characters is relatively new to the cowboy life, so he's always getting beat up. The work is hard. He doesn't know all these things. And they, they sort of jab him. They say, oh, you, you can't rope for anything. But there's something endearing about that because even though they're, like, kind of jabbing him, they're kind of pushing him, they're honestly like grooming him to become a cowboy. Mm -hmm. there, there's stuff that you have to go through to become a cowboy. And eventually when you put your time in, they, they sort of look at you and they say, wow, now, now you're a real cowboy. Why don't we have that mentality in cybersecurity where there are some people that are mentors and they say, yep, I'm going to help groom these people, people like Marcus Carey. But I don't think as like employers, we take that same mindset. Mm -hmm. We don't say, all right, we're going to help develop the next generation of cybersecurity practitioners. I need stuff fixed now because I got all my houses on fire. Yeah, it's a common problem. And it's a problem of need and necessity. And it goes back to your first question to me about what's the biggest challenge as a CISO, right? Well, one of those biggest challenges is getting the funding to really, truly achieve mission. Right. Let's assume that's true. And let's assume that, that securing the proper funding to really get the program going the way you want it to go is, is, is the biggest challenge. You end up having to ultimately, and we're getting a little bit sidetracked here, but you have to measure risk. You have to come up with what you believe are the top risk. You have the conversation with the organization and collectively you and, and upstairs come to, here's what we're going to fund and how much risk we're willing to address and tackle. At that point, you are already as the CISO feeling undermanned, outgunned, mm -hmm. underfunded, yep. and struggling uphill. And so this pressure, this demand, this, this idea that everybody's got a real time be there to solve the immediate problem. Mm -hmm. Don't hire me a junior person that I have to train up. I need somebody plugging that hole today. Right. It's a very real pressure. It's mm -hmm. a very real pressure. And it takes a lot of skill as a CISO to back off of that pressure, to not let that drive how you architect and structure your team. Mm -hmm. You have to stop and breathe. You have to have a little patience. You have to invest in your people because if you don't, all you're doing is passing that pressure on to them. Yeah. And speaking of people leaving the industry or leaving to go work somewhere else, boy, that's a real quick way to drive off the entire organization. So the pressure is very real, but you can't cave to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You know what's funny is I've been technical my whole life. I've always been like getting into the weeds of technology, trying to be a programmer, trying mm. to be a hacker. And my definition of cybersecurity skills, I think is different than a lot of other people's definitions. Mm, like for more. me, being a cybersecurity technologist or a skilled cybersecurity practitioner means that you have these technical skills. You can you know, pull up a terminal, you can configure a machine or a system or an application. And you also have a little bit of programming experience, at least that the mindset to say, if this, then that. Mm -hmm. So I think we also have to think about like, what are the, what are the cybersecurity skills? And is there a gap within those skills? Right, but if you look at like my background, I'm a threat intel guy. Like I would struggle if you told me to do a lot of stuff on the <laughs> terminal, right? That's just not, that's not my background. Yeah. I focus on the threats, what is happening from the strategic, operational, and technical level. So I, I can explain what attacks are. I can even make predictions about where attacks are heading. But if you said, you know, I want you to hop on this terminal and, and spin some stuff up, I'm not going to be able to do it. Can I do things like be a security analyst? I've done that before. I've mm -hmm. done tier three SOC level work. But still, I'm not somebody that can pop open a terminal and start running bash commands. I'm not a person that's going to start writing in Python. I've lived my entire career at the an analytical level, whether it's through intelligence or security or even incident response. For me, the best skill for me to have as an incident responder is being able to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can look at somebody like a journalist and they can ask really thought-provoking, interesting questions. Or even someone that's really skilled at organizational design or organizational mm -hmm. leadership. And so then they can say, okay, th these are the people that are in charge of X, Y, and Z. They're the people that needs to be in the room for this, this particular incident. Right. I think we, got, we have to open our minds to the other skill sets that people offer. We were just talking earlier today about uh, one of my, my favorite bosses of all time. His name is Dano. And uh, we were working for the government and he said, hey, Chris, I want to show you something. Come on over here. So I sat down with him and he said, uh, do you know why we get paid what we get paid? And I said, uh, well, it's because of our, is what, what we do, right? We're, we're paid to sit here in the seat and do work. He's like, close, but that's not it. And he pulled out this sheet of paper and the sheet of paper had all of our names, all the people that he was leading on one side. And across the top, he had skills. And then within this chart, he had these little X's. And he said, I call this my chart of X's. And he was saying that we get paid for the skills that we have. And if we want more work, if I wanted to say, hey, we can also do additional work to the stuff that we're doing, these are the skills that we have. Yep. I don't know hardly any leaders that have taken stock of the skills that they currently have on their team to the nth degree. Okay, this person can do X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other. Understanding the skills of what each person can do is beyond important. Being able to send a message. I mean, just having that skill of design and eye, like being able to take a picture, you can send a message to someone so much better if you have that, that eye for design. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think are your skills that cybersecurity practitioners and technologists typically have? And like, what do you like to see as a CISO? Yeah, it's, it's funny because as a CISO, you know, I'm listening to the two backgrounds that you guys yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> And I share some of your background, and I share some of your background as well. Back in the day, I was, I was a hacker. I was writing my own code, and I was compiling yeah. kernels back when compiling kernels was not easily done. And I developed all those technical skills. I got into the analytics skills as well. Mm. And I even did a stint in GRC on purpose. I, I wanted to teach myself the GRC side of the house and get away from the technical side for a while and learn their piece of it. And all of these skills combined, and today here I am as a CISO using very few of any of those skills. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most of what I do is business and communication, mm -hmm. right? And so to your question as to what are these skills, well, again, I majored in liberal arts right. on my yeah. undergraduate. <laughs> I got a master's degree in InfoSec, so I got my, got my street cred. <laughs> um, right. But, uh, but my undergrad was in liberal arts, and honestly, I would argue that I rely more on that degree than I do on my InfoSec degree in, mm -hmm. in my daily life as a CISO. The, the communication, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you learn as an English lit major, for example, is uh, the ability to ingest incredible amounts of information at a rapid speed, to digest them, and to produce your own narrative and analysis at a rapid mm -hmm. rate of speed. Mm -hmm. That is an incredibly valuable skill for anybody in cyber, any kind of leadership position right. for any of the analyst type roles, for any of the GRC type roles. Even for somebody trying to learn new tech, you gotta be able to crunch the manual and very quickly get to the heart of the matter and figure out the thing and spit out the outputs, right? Mm -hmm. So those kinds of skills to me are far more interesting and far more valuable than 
Do you happen to know how to write in that specific programming right. language? Do you happen to know that particular threat intelligence platform? Right. Right. Yeah. To me, those native skills that are that are harder won and harder gained are yeah. so much more critical. Yep. Alan is a programmer because I know that you are one of the best, you know, people that can break down a spreadsheet. Mm. I know that you've been working with these spreadsheets that have millions and millions <laughs> yep. of lines. And that's what it really is at the end of the day. We're looking at data. We're taking in this data. We're doing something with it. We're making sense out of it. And what you said that is really important is we're telling that story. Mm -hmm. You're taking this information. You're telling that story. That's what you did as an analyst. Right. You're able to break it down and tell that story. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn that until way later on. I thought I could really rely and lean on these technical skills and you know, just yeah. show off yeah. my Python and programming. Yeah. Yep. But what it turned out was those skills are valuable, but they're not rare. Mm -hmm. And what I found for me, I'm really trying to search for this freedom. I want this autonomy in my workplace. I want this autonomy in my career and life. Yep. And the real way that you get that is by gaining rare and valuable skills. And mm -hmm. storytelling is that, that other component that's mm -hmm. rare for a lot of technologists. Absolutely yep. it is. And, and I'll tell you something too. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm second generation InfoSec. Mm -hmm. My dad was actually a security guy in the mainframe era. I am second generation. Yeah. And when the mainframes first hit and started to pick up widespread usage in the business world, there weren't enough people to man them. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking desperately to hire anybody that could run these computers. And they didn't have a rapid talent. The schools weren't cranking out computer degrees yet. You could get a business degree maybe with a bit of a focus and took a computer class or two and maybe that'd be about it. So they were desperate for any kind of talent back in those days. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, an employment application was not a process of what do you know. Mm -hmm. It was all about aptitude. You yeah. were basically given the miniature version of like a logic and IQ test. Mm -hmm. And you could know nothing about computers, but demonstrate that your brain was wired the way that computer type brains need to be, yep. right. get the job and learn on the fly. Yep. And uh, th there was a role, the, the, the mainframe era, the very first role you got in the data center was you were the guy that moved the tape reels physically. They were called tape monkeys. Those guys almost always got their job off of an aptitude test that was just checking for how their brain was wired rather than the knowledge that was in their brain at the time. Interesting. Yeah. You know, that's one thing that, you know, Ron and I, we've done dozens and dozens of talks at, to, the, to date. And one of the times we had a talk and they were saying, well, what is the most important skill in cybersecurity? things are changing all the time. And I said, honestly, the most important skill that you can have in cybersecurity or really any job that changes is mental agility. The ability to pivot and move because cybersecurity changes all the time. Technology changes all the time. Every single day there's mm -hmm. something new that we have to adjust to. Even my background, if I had to come in today, it would be much more difficult for me to come in with the background that I came in with. So I had traditional intelligence, but now you're looking at teams that are much more engineering focused. So you look at a cybersecurity team as like purely an engineering team in some places. So it would be more difficult for me to come in now. So that led me to think that maybe there is a gap in those skills because if now if everyone's looking for people that have that engineering background from a cybersecurity perspective, those people are gonna be harder and harder to find. People that have already have that experience with cloud infrastructure. Fewer and fewer, right? But like we take somebody like our good friend Maurice, right? He has been with legacy networking pretty much this entire time since me and him were in the Marine Corps together. But now, boom, you give him a shot, you give him six months like to just kind of immerse himself into the flames of new age cloud native technology. And now we brought him on the podcast to explain like, hey, how has it been that transition for you? Just giving people that chance is really all I really think it takes for, if, if people just change that mindset for a moment yep. and say, why don't I give people a chance? Let's look for that mental agility. Let's look for that aptitude that you're talking about. Yep. Right? So Alan, we affectionately call you the habitual CISO, which is the Chief Information Security Officer. How many times have you been CISO? Five times now. So in those five different times, all together, how many people have you led? All together, close to 150. Wow. One of the things I really love about you, Alan, is that you are this person that just has this energy to learn and constantly improve themselves and mm -hmm. put yourself in these different situations. I remember when we first met, 
and you were like, hey, you know, I got this podcast, I'm doing great things. And then another minute you're like, I want to do my own podcast. I want to branch off and do something different. Yeah. And now you're like, I don't want to just be CISO, I want to be CTO. And maybe there's this COO thing. Maybe there's all these other things that I could start to, to build upon and ultimately become. And when you get to that, how do you look at your future? Like, what do you, what do you see as that next step? Because I feel like once you make it so far in security, it's almost like you have to go somewhere else. You have to become mm -hmm. something greater. We did a whole show on my show, actually, on what comes after CISO. Mm. Uh, I had Helen Patton on and we talked yeah. about this and we talked about a lot of different things. And it's, it's interesting. It's really bloody easy to be a COO and eventually become a CEO. Mm -hmm. It's fairly easy to be a CFO and possibly become a CEO, mm -hmm. a CRO, a CSO. Like there's all these different roles that, that have a, a fairly distinct path. But for CISO, it almost tends to be the last destination on the train. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, now what? I'm a CISO, now what? I've been yeah. one five times, now what? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, in my case, I chose slash CTO. Uh, other people do all kinds of interesting things. Um, people go with, uh, I'm going to retire out and do board. Some people retire out and go analyst, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. an industry analyst, not a not a you know yeah. an intelligence analyst, but an industry analyst. Right. Uh, some people just bail out and become founders and do startups. Um, I've got I've got we've got a good friend uh, who's doing that right now as we speak. He was a CISO just a couple of months ago, and now he's a founder. So that's a common path, but none of them are normal. I mean, there's probably a dozen different paths that you see when people finish CISO and, and go on to whatever their next thing might right. be. Mm -hmm. But there's almost no CISO to CEO journey mm. that's been established yet. CISO mm. is a relatively new position in its own right. Yeah. And there's no clear path from it to CEO. I got to ask both of y'all, what is more important, especially like you guys are the ones I know that have led the most people and the most teams. What is most important for someone breaking in? Like they want to get started, especially in cybersecurity. Is it that potential that they have, that aptitude to learn and understand the mental agility? Or is it something else? Or is it like just having a skill set of something? Like you have to have this base level of expertise in something, whether it's spreadsheets, whether it's uh, philosophy mm. or, or literature. Do you need a base level? Or do you just need aptitude and potential? I think aptitude and tenacity. If you take somebody that has a little bit of aptitude, a little bit of potential, but they're tenacious when it comes to learning, when it comes to figuring things out, you'd be surprised. Like, I, I'm sure I've surprised people in the past on certain things. Like, you know me, I go deep when it comes to learning something new. So, like, I almost obsess over it. <laughs> and so I could come out of a week worth of research and be able to give maybe like a five minute lightning talk on a particular subject. If you have somebody that has that type of hunger, that type of passion for doing something, whatever it is, that's a person worth their weight in gold. Cause you How know long does it try. take though? Like if you were gonna bring on someone with just tenacity and aptitude, how long is it gonna really take to get that person up it to speed? It depends on the job. Yeah. It depends on the job, it depends on what they've done in the background just a little bit. So for instance, if you have somebody that just came out of college with a lit degree, I would feel relatively comfortable putting them alongside my other threat intelligence analysts, having them see, oh, these are the terminologies, these are the things that are going on, because that person can at least write. Could somebody come in off the street and be a malware analyst? That would be much more difficult. Right, right. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if the aptitude approach that they had in the mainframe era, you know, that, that got them in trouble. Um, HR-wise, like, it's not considered a cool thing to do anymore. But I would love to put together some sort of measure that basically says, to your point, I'm going to summarize what you said as attitude and aptitude. Yeah. Mm, attitude, yes. right? Mm -hmm. I love that. So how do you capture that? Like, in a job interview, you can ask questions like, what's your tech stack at home? You know, yep. what, what do you play with at home? What do you do to geek out? You know, like, yep. oh yeah, well I got this thing and I downloaded this and I'm over on Amazon Cloud doing the free thing here that they yep. let you do and da 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 mm -hmm. And they start getting all jazzed and excited yeah. about whatever it is. That's a really good sign right there. Really you're, you're dealing with somebody who's a self learner, check that box. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with somebody who's enthused about it, check that box. Mm -hmm. And all that comes from one simple question. Right. What you, tell me about your rig at home. What's your yep. kid at home? How do you play with this stuff at home? What do you do? What do you do for fun with this stuff? Questions like that, right? Simple question of, you know, I'm going to give you some stuff and you're going to output some stuff back to me. You could put together a pretty simple interview that would meet modern HR requirements, 
that would help you drill in on attitude and aptitude, that you could even adapt and have plug-in modules. I'm almost picturing like modular documents type approach. Right, yeah. You know, for the different roles on your team. And to your point, an English lit major could easily be a good uh, frontline analyst for like a threat intel type yep. analyst, right? But, but again, malware analyst, you need somebody with more technical bent. Uh, pen tester, you could start with somebody from QA, et cetera, et cetera. You could easily put together and architect an interview process that welcomed all these people with these base skill sets, with these base aptitudes and attitudes, brought them in and, and tested them and say, you know what, you're, you're good enough to walk in the door to this role, we'll get you going the rest. Right. And your question to him was, how, how long can that take? Right. I've got an intern on my team right now. Uh, I, actually, I have an ex-intern on my team right oh, now. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, he, he was an intern and he was thrown to the wolves. Like, here you go. Here's, here's, here's the deep end of the pool. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> here's your bricks. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> have fun. Godspeed. And I inherited the team and took one look at this guy and realized there was so much potential here. And invested just a little bit of extra time in him over the course of a few months. He's now one of the leaders in the team. Mm, he wow. owns whole processes in the team. And senior guys much older than him are like, oh, yeah, he owns that. Wow. Nice. Uh, a few months of investment on our part. Now, that may be a rare story. That may be a corner case. He's an exceptionally talented individual. But I've had other interns with similar stories where within six months they're doing what I need them to do. Mm. And, and that sounds like a lot sometimes. It's, again, back to that pressure that a CISO was under of, oh, my God, we got to get it all done and we're under man. Uh, yep. I need someone now. But if you think about it, even an expert, talented experienced person who's already done whatever you've hired him for at another shop and did it for five years is still going to take three months before they're useful. True. Mm -hmm. So you're really only saying it's three months beyond the norm if you're going to invest six months in getting somebody trained up. So yep. looked at that way, it's always worth investing in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how do we change this mindset of, you know, let's bring in everyone? Because right now we're just putting out calls for, we need this particular skill right now with these many years of experience. Right. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing. And so the people that are looking to come in, they're going through job rec after job rec and they're like, that's not me. Mm -hmm. That's not me. Mm -hmm. That's not me. So we're leaving a lot on a table mm -hmm. as a society. How do we change that mentality to opening up the doors on the employer side, but then also showing the people that have these particular skill sets that even though you're not all the way there, you have a job here. I had, in my life, I had two big breaks. And the first big break was uh, high school education. I had a vocational school attached to my high school mm. that I would duck out of high school halfway through the day, every day, and go to this vocational school and learn computer networking. And there was a lot of people that didn't take that as an opportunity because they weren't interested in technology like I was interested in technology. Yep. These people ultimately wanted a job, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of their high school career, just like I did, but they didn't, you know, really educate us and let us know that, hey, you should be looking at this as a career opportunity, not just as something that you might want to do here and there and tinker with technology. And I think we need to do that a lot more with like high schools. Right now, I don't think there's a lot of cybersecurity education or even security in general, how to, how to protect oneself. How do you operate securely in this world? Mm. There's been a lot of situations online where I put myself at a risk. I'm sure we all have, especially with our passwords. <laughs> but I think you know, there's a lot that we could do with education and it really starts there. If the, if the youth aren't interested in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. then how are we gonna get people to shift this mindset and be confident in applying mm. for the jobs that they're not qualified for. So, so you've cracked open a big door right yes. there. <laughs> you, you really have, because this, this is why anytime I do any kind of a charity event, somebody asks me what charity do you want to donate to? What do I always say? Black Girls Code. Black Girls Code, why? Because it's not just a matter of capturing the youth and getting them into it. It's mm -hmm. capturing whole demographics that historically haven't gotten into it. Yes. There are far less black people in cyber than there mm -hmm. should be. There are far less women in cyber than there should be. Yep. And there are far less kids getting into it at that age than mm -hmm. there should be. That's a charity that's nailing all three in one go. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. We should be investing in every possible nook and cranny that might feed the pipeline, the, the, the big end of the funnel. Right. Who's not coming into cyber that could be and should be? Well, let's, let's ask that question and let's take a real hard look at ourselves and figure out why aren't they wanting in? Mm -hmm. What are right. we doing to discourage them or at a minimum not encourage them? Mm -hmm. It's still intimidating. I think it's still intimidating to start as something like a technologist, as a, a practitioner rather than a leader or a manager because you do have to work your way up. 
And like I was describing, you have to learn how to use those storytelling skills. For me, I didn't have someone, you know, telling me stories and mm -hmm. you know, reciting these stories. I was trying to tell my computer stories and tell it how to do things and right, yeah. try to get your computer to do something on my behalf. But yeah. I think it's, it could be very intimidating to not only go so long trying to capture these skills of technology, but then to go and try to get these other skills, like how to lead people. Mm -hmm. I think that is something that we also forget about when it comes to education, especially yeah. for technology education, whether it's cybersecurity or something else, mm -hmm. high school or college. We, we focus so much on the craft, but so little on all the other auxiliary things that come with it. Yeah, just like going for it. I would say 99.9% .9 of the jobs that I've been selected for I did not have all the requisite skills mm -hmm. that were on the job rec. Oh, I've never, like, ever had all the requisite right. skills. <laughs> exactly. Ever. Right, yeah, yeah. Maybe the one time where, I, like, hey, you got to flip the burger. Like, got it. And that's the, the 0.01% that where I was good. So what do you think got you the job? What got me the job is that the storytelling that you're talking about. Mm. Because if I can take stuff that I've done and apply it to the problem set that they're looking to solve for, they see a match. Right. If I, even if I don't have all those skills and I say, you know what? I don't have all those skills. I got maybe 70% of these skills, 30% of it I'm gonna have to learn on the job. I'm gonna go for it. You just, you just literally listed Alan's rule, the 70-30 <laughs> rule. Every what, what job is I get though? is 70% what I already know so I can walk in and say, you're gonna pay me what I want because I know this 70% cold and I know it well, yeah. and we're gonna negotiate the deal based on that 70, but I'm deliberately choosing this job because of the 30% I don't know. Yeah. Right. How else am I gonna grow and get into the next role if I don't deliberately embrace some chunk of something that I don't know? Right. Every role I try to take something I don't know. I'm a CTO right now, I'm having a blast. Why? Because I've never been one before, mm. Yeah. you know? I walked in the door Love as a CISO that. slash CTO, and the CTO was the part I negotiated. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll be your CISO. That's the 70. I want the CTO. That's the 30. Right. Do something a little different. Exactly. So what is cybersecurity? Like, let's, let's cut down to the raw fundamentals of what is cybersecurity. Is it an IT profession? Mm -hmm. No. It's a data profession. Right. Your job is to protect data. Data resides in a far bigger scope and magnitude now than any IT-specific function. And information risk, which is even bigger than data, is part of the CISO charter as well because information and data aren't necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so a proper CISO's program is going to have to be much more aligned with business risk, chief risk officer, and those types of roles than it would be aligned with the IT role. One of my favorite scenarios in all of hiring ever was actually when we interviewed Napoleon. And just somewhere in the conversation, I'm like, well, what, what is your background? Like, what, what have you like spent time like studying and learning and all this stuff? I see you have your degree. And he says, plant science. And I'm like, plant science. Wow. <laughs> and right then, like my questions changed. And I was like, so tell me, how would you compare like the systems of a plant to the systems of technology? And so he was like, oh, well, it's very similar to this, 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 and this. And he tells this story like based on plant science mm -hmm. and technology. And I'm like, this is the guy, this is the guy. Even though his like core foundation wasn't cybersecurity or even necessarily technology, he could understand a system and then tell a story about that system. Right. What, what was that initial thing that, I'm sure you, you were part of that inspiration for Napoleon to get into it. Like, tell us like a little bit about how that started. For him? For him, yeah. Well, me, I make all my friends get into cybersecurity. <laughs> all my friends are in cybersecurity. And it, it goes back to that, that freedom aspect that I was talking about. I think with mm -hmm. when you're working in cybersecurity, when you're working in technology, you have a lot of opportunity for freedom. Like this is one of the most autonomous fields that you can be in. You could work your schedule that works best for you within reason. Right. But a lot of times you'll go to corporate America and you'll have to start at nine and you have to sit in that seat until five. With cybersecurity and technology, you have a little bit more flexibility. And the other piece of all of that that I think interested him was the monetary aspects That's important of to talk about. Yes. But we never really talk about it. We don't, it's taboo. It's very taboo to talk about money and how much you make mm -hmm. and the opportunity. Because when you look at cybersecurity, especially the 
starting salaries. You might see up to $100,000 starting salary. That's right. very lucrative for a lot of people, very advantageous. Mm -hmm. But when you interview, you might get told, hey, we'll, we'll offer you $45,000. We'll offer yeah. you $65,000. Mm -hmm. And that could be a little jarring. So I think a lot of the times when we look at even the skills gap or the, the skills shortage or whatever it may be, it sometimes comes back to money. Mm. Like how much are you willing to mm -hmm. pay? Mm -hmm. Do I have to go through a negotiation wrangle just to get you know, how much I, I, I'm, I'm worth? There is this book that I read called Never Split the Difference by Chris mm. Voss. Mm -hmm. And he talks about this element of black swans. And a black swan mm. is when you probe for information, and ultimately something else is leaked as part of that bit of information. Like I ask mm -hmm. you, well, what is your range as, right. the, as the candidate? And yeah. you, you, the employer, tell me it's somewhere between 70 and 90. Now I know I want the 90,000. Right. That was the black swan. <laughs> and I think when you, even if you go into your interview in a lot of organizations and you have a great interview, you're not really going to get that, that top end in a lot of cases. I hear this all the time. A lot of people don't get it. And I, I've been in that situation quite a bit, and it takes weeks to ultimately extract that resource and get what you think you deserve. So I, uh, I've got an interesting situation with that throughout my entire career, which is that I've never been a big bargainer of that sort. Mm. Uh, I've got a friend, uh, my buddy Jamie, Absolutely mercenary. Every single role he's ever gotten, he got the absolute top dollar they were willing to give for that role. Right. Every single time. Mm -hmm. He plays hardball. Yeah. And it is just a very different style from mine. I'm much more interested in what the job is, what the opportunity is, what the environment is, et cetera, et cetera. And then we talk range, and I'm like, oh, a little more than what you first offered. Okay, right. here it is. Okay, cool, I'm cool. You know, and I always get a little more than what they first offered, and that's about it for me. But what's interesting is you talked about that taboo nature of it. Something really weird happened to me when I made CISO. My entire career discussing salary with peers, even with friends and colleagues outside of work, like it's it's kind of a taboo thing. You don't brag about your salary. You don't you know right. you don't talk salary with people. I know what the salaries and bonus and and pay structures are of probably half my CISO friends. Mm. Why is that? I I'm not sure, but we've all started comparing notes recently. Yeah, Ooh, okay. and there are some entities out there that I can think right, right off the top of my bat, I've seen, you know, off the top of my head, I've seen three of these charts just in the last month. Uh, Hitch Partners does one. There's yep. a couple of other entities that do one. They will survey the entire CISO community all over the, all over America and break it up by Southeast and Southwest and Midwest and Texas and whatever, all their regions, whatever regions they come up with. And they get what is average salary, what is average bonus, what is average equity mm -hmm. for publicly traded, privately held, da 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 mm -hmm. And these charts are now published. Yep. They're common knowledge. Every time one comes out, the CISOs all share them with each other and they all compare notes. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot more about salary stuff with my peers and my friends than I ever have in my entire life. And I'm still not quite sure what triggered that or why it is. It's still sometimes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just was raised. You don't talk about that, right? You right, just right. you don't. But there's power in that. There's a lot of power in that, power and we're in supporting each other, work. and we're bolstering each other. Mm -hmm. And this whole idea now that everything is work from home, from anywhere, yeah. and so many new roles have opened up, it's getting really weird because it's like, what if it's a Bay Area company, but I'm in Texas? Can I get a <laughs> Bay Area? <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> and um, and those kinds of things are happening now too. So it's it's gotten very interesting. It's it's a lot more transparent for the CISO community than it has been anywhere else in my entire life or career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a really weird twist. I'm not sure what caused it or where it came from, but you're right, it's very empowering. Yeah. You know, when you mentioned like COVID and work from home, it made me think of like this great resignation. I think like we hear it all the time in technology, mm -hmm. but we hear it even outside of technology. There's these people out there, including myself, that have switched career fields or switched employers during yeah. this time. Right. And I think there has to be something that keeps you staying in technology, mm -hmm. in cybersecurity. For me, I think like there's a, there's a bunch of different reasons. It's really the opportunities that I have as a person. Like with, with Hacker Valley Media, we have this podcast, we have this awesome show. So I, I'm using this as like a, a mechanism, a vehicle for voice, for myself, for others, yep. and to have great conversations with people like yourself. And there's a lot of reasons for me to stay, but I think for other people, there might not be enough of those reasons. What, what do you mm -hmm. think those reasons are that people are like, 
I'm just not getting enough of this or that. I'm going to go ahead and move employers and get out this field. I feel like it's just people that aren't in alignment, mm -hmm. right? We talk about burnout being mm -hmm. not in alignment with the tasks that mean the world to you, the things that don't fill your cup. Right. I felt like there was a huge switch in me. You know, Ron and I, we focus on personal growth and development all the time. We have coaches, we have uh, trainers, we have books that we read and take courses. And one of the most important parts of my life, period, is when I lined up my abilities, the things that I do really well, my superpower, if you want to call it that, with my purpose. Like, what is my purpose? Well, my purpose is I want to inspire people through story. I want to mm -hmm. inspire people through narrative, whatever it is. Like, I want people to take the, these stories, the, the wisdom, the accolades, whatever it is, take that with them, embody it, and then do something that they want to do. Do something that means something to them. So when people don't feel that, when people feel ostracized, when people feel like they aren't a part of a, a whole, a part of a bigger team, right. that's when they're like, I'm out of here. Mm. I, it's, not, it's not worth it. You know, you see people working from home. Maybe you hear a story of somebody that's doing their work and they're like, I love going to work every day. Like, I can't wait for Monday. Do you know how many people out there right now are dreading Monday? Right, yeah. Yeah. They're dreading money. They don't want to go to work. And so that's when they're like, you know what? With all this like calamity that's going on, it's time for a change. It, it ties back to that aptitude test model because at the end of the day, and it, it's, it's what you said, it, it's what I call being in your groove, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you know what your aptitude is, you know what your groove is, you know what your predilections are, mm -hmm. you now know the types of things that keep you in your groove. Right. And very often, to your point, you can be over here and the job is over there and it's not going to work. It's not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I try to do as a leader, I just had this conversation with my team today. I literally pulled the whole team together and said, okay, you've been working on this for a long time. You've been working on that for a long time. You've been working on the other and the other. All four of you have been doing this thing for a long time. This is my team that does the, the product content for the product. Yeah. And I said, who's, who's, who's reaching burnout? Who's ready to bang their forehead on the desk because they're sick of doing the same thing over and over and over? Mm -hmm. Some hands raised. I said, okay, let's switch it up. This next cycle, I've got, these are the opportunities I have. I'm going to make sure that you get to do this thing. You get to do that thing. You get to do the other thing. You get to do the other thing. One of the guys had been doing the same task for quite some time, mm -hmm. didn't raise his hand. So he's already in his groove. Mm -hmm. Give me more. I like this. This is good. I'm okay with this repetition because this is my flavor of repetition. Right. Everybody else, I had to mix it up a little and make sure you get to do some of what you're, you know. But the point is, everyone finds that spot. Now, not every job can you as a leader make sure everyone gets that all the time always, but you can do what I did today and make sure they at least get it some of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, this part of the job starts to feel like a grind. You know what? We got these other opportunities and I get that you're really kind of suited for this and this, so you're going to do that. Yep. And it's back to that aptitude thing as well. I've got a guy who's really, really, really good at QA <laughs> and I've made him point on our internal SOC 2 audit. Mm. And I told him, you're going to get to QA the entire organization. You should have seen his eyes just light up. Like, <laughs> oh, oh, that thing I love doing yeah. on a bigger, bigger scale. You know, right. like, mm -hmm. like, so it's just, there's, there's clever moments like that. It's not just when you hire, it's, it's the whole time as a leader. You have to constantly be thinking about that. You need to know what people's strengths are. And this is, our friend Nick is still trying to get me to do Clifton Strengths. I promised yeah. him I would do it this weekend. Uh, and we're going to have a whole conversation around that because that's, cool. that's kind of the Clifton Strengths model. It's not like a Myers-Briggs where they're just like, are you this or are you that? It's right. more like, what are your natural predilections? Exactly. What is your groove, mm -hmm. in other words? Yeah. And so it's kind of that approach that I've always taken, even without having the formal testing. I've got a good feel for everyone on my team, where their sweet spot is, where their groove is. And I try to make sure that they get to be in their groove at least a, a substantial portion of the time, even if it's 30%, you know, that's better than none. And I go out of my way to make sure they get that 30%. And people don't quit my organizations. Right. Just, just that simple gesture alone goes a long way. That's huge. Confidence. People, that, don't, people don't quit my organization. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty serious. Because what we were saying earlier, he solved a disconnect. Right. So I think for this conversation, when we're talking about the gap, people are hung up on the gap word. Mm. Let's throw it out. Let's call it the cybersecurity disconnect. Yeah. Get everybody together, the employers, the people that are looking to come into our great community, and let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. When you look at the skills gap, I think you're right. There's this, this disconnect that is happening, and we could rephrase it. Cybersecurity is one of those fields that is constantly evolving. 
Like, there's never going to be an end. Mm -hmm. You can't go to an organization, you can't start a company and say, I've solved cybersecurity. Right. You can't, you can't build this lock that is going to keep everybody out. Right. And you can't build a lock that isn't going to be prone to errors. Right. So I think we need to not look at this as a gap, really. Like, it's yeah. more of an opportunity. This is a cybersecurity skills opportunity. Oh. Where we have the opportunity to give people more and more skills and more opportunity. Like I was saying, I'm a huge fan of the monetary aspect of cybersecurity. I'm a huge fan of the opportunities that we get to speak at conferences yeah, and right. to one another and all this collaboration. But we have this opportunity to advance ourselves and yeah. use this as a moment of empathy. Mm -hmm. There's you know, times where we show up at work and people just don't get why this is so important. Like, I don't know why this is so important. You're putting too much emphasis on trying to lock all of this badness out of my device but it's like we're actually trying to give you more of an opportunity to innovate freely we're trying to give you more of an opportunity to do the things that are going to help accelerate the business and your team not a gap but really this opportunity there we go so all right disconnect yeah opportunity better and more accurate description than gap opportunity spins it makes it positive Mm -hmm. Puts me in a corner now. I got to come up with something <laughs> new, right? Invitation. Mm. It's Why is the that? cyber skills invitation because it goes back to what we were talking about in the first place. There's all these people with these beautiful and elegant minds, yeah. with this ability to process information, with this ability to input and output great stories and great analysis, with this ability to dig into detail, to find root cause, with a passion to uncover, to tinker to discover, to take apart, to put back together again. Yeah. We want to invite that entire community into cyber. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm going to call it the invitation. I love yes. it. Love that. I got chills.